Good afternoon. In order to be on time, we want to start uh, right on time. And uh, I would like to welcome you all uh, to this special session with the ESC. It became really a routine to have session uh, with the ESC at our meeting, and it has always been of very, very high quality. Uh, this year also we have a very exciting program, and it is my pleasure to invite the first speaker, the co-chair, Professor Pinto, uh, the president of the European Society of Cardiology. Uh, Professor Pinto will talk about the role of scientific societies in promoting good clinical practice. Uh, please, Professor Pinto. Well, thank you very much, uh, Josef. Uh, Professor Rosman, it's a real pleasure, as I've mentioned this morning, uh, to be here again. And also thank uh, the Israel Heart Society for organizing this uh, joint session with, uh, with the ESC. It's uh, now, I would say, a tradition that I'm sure we'll continue to have over the next uh, uh, years. And I think it's very important, uh, this uh, sort of uh, uh, meetings and uh, this sort of uh, joint meetings so we can share some ideas and look into the future also and how we can improve the way uh, we are doing our patient management, we're doing our education. At the end, we are fulfilling our, our mission. So what I will try over the next few minutes is to give you a little bit of uh, data and a little bit of some ideas on how society, scientific societies can help us to improve, to shape uh, clinical practice, and also, of course, using the ESC and give you a little bit of uh, uh, information. Some of you, I'm sure, are aware of some of these different activities, but how at the ESC level we've been trying to fulfill this uh, commitment of uh, promoting good clinical practice. So um, although, and we've seen this morning uh, on uh, Professor Roseman's uh, lecture that cancer is picking up, but overall cardiovascular disease, and it's not only cardiac disease of course, is still the number one killer in the world worldwide despite some uh, uh, improvements, significant improvements in the way that uh, we've been treating uh, or the community has been treating cardiovascular disease, it's still the number one. And the, uh, the projections of WHO as a whole, cardiovascular disease, uh, it's most likely will continue to be the number one killer in the world. And this is sort of relevant because when particularly when you have to deal with some decision makers, it's important that uh, we continue to make sure that the awareness on the weight of uh, and the burden of cardiovascular disease is still relevant. And, uh, and this is just some data coming from uh, Europe, again showing the, in terms of the so-called NCDs, non-communicable uh, diseases, how much cardiovascular disease overall, although there are some changes in some countries and in some countries there is sort of a shift in this uh, uh, correlation, but overall it's still the number one killer in the world. And if we look at data coming from Europe, cardiovascular disease kills about two million European citizens each year. And this is actually at the moment altogether more than all cancers combined. The cost is close to 200 billion euros per year. We also know that despite the fact that uh, we've been very successful in reducing mortality, and I will show you some uh, uh, current and recent data in that regard, we also know that the prevalence of disease is increasing because of the increase and in the weight of some risk factors, particularly still the high rates of uh, smoking, in particular in some areas of uh, the globe, uh, obesity, diabetes, the cardiometabolic syndrome, that altogether, and of course, the aging population, um, but this is, the aging population is sort of an uh, ambivalence because on one hand we prolong life, but of course by increasing uh, uh, lifespan, we're increasing the aging population and we know also that the prevalence of disease will increase with the aging population. On the other hand, we also see some significant differences among different countries, and this is just an example where you can see this gradient in Europe from east to west and from north uh, to south which again, and we know there are many reasons why this uh, happens, and a lot have to do with one important component of uh, uh, what we should be doing more, which has to do with the whole prevention area, because we do know that about 75% uh, of uh, diseases after, uh, b before the age of uh, 65 years old, they can actually be at least partially preventable. But let me give you a little bit of the most recent data on uh, uh, Europe, uh, which uh, is coming from the OECD, which uh, uh, basically we have three main 
uh, trends that stand out of uh, these reports, the OECD was created in 61, and there are three major trends that stand out. The first one is the remarkable gains in life expectancy. And here again, it's very important that 80% of the uh, gain in life expectancy has been due to the developments in cardiovascular medicine. So the, our community is responsible for 80% of the uh, gain in life expectancy worldwide. So the last 10 years of increase in life expectancy, eight were due to uh, the developments in cardiovascular medicine. For instance, oncology contributed about eight to nine months increase in life expectancy, unfortunately. Uh, the second one is the changing nature of risk factors to health, and again, this explains why we've been very successful in decreasing the mortality, but we're not so successful in decreasing the prevalence of disease. And the third one, which are very well aware of that, is the steady growth in health spending, which has exceeded the GDP growth by a substantial amount, and of course, and Today, uh, our President-elect's talk was a little bit addressing this issue in the topic of sudden death, and this is something also that as a community we have to keep in mind. These are, I don't want to bother you too much with data, but this just basically shows the increase in life expectancy, but also, also important to look at healthy life years. So not only the amount of years that we increase in life expectancy, but also the amount of healthy life years. And again, here we've been very successful as a community because of this. This is, uh, uh, was published a couple of years ago by Professor Brownold and Professor Nabel, which basically shows the correlation between the different uh, procedures and the different uh, new developments in treatment and diagnostic strategies over time since the early 50s until, the, uh, until now, the current time, and the, the correlation with the decrease in, uh, in global mortality, which again shows that every time that there is some innovation and that innovation translates into clinical practice, there is also an impact in terms of global mortality demonstrating the role of these different procedures and the impact in global mortality. But this is the problem, the second part of uh, the conclusions of OECD. There is an increased prevalence of uh, obesity among adults. We can see here that there are quite substantial differences among the different countries, but overall there is an increased tendency for obesity and of course this translates into an increase in, di in diabetes, in the prevalence of diabetes, prevalence of cardiometabolic syndrome, and, uh, and the other important risk factor is smoking. We still have a problem with smoking uh, in the, uh, these uh, uh, different countries, and uh, this is something particularly for, the, uh, for instance, the adolescent and young adults, females, there is a, a substantial increase in the rate of smoking, which is something that as a community we have to look at that, we can see here the gender gap in uh, smoking rates, which is still a problem and certainly something that has an impact not only on cardiovascular disease, but has an overall impact on the so-called non-communicable -com uh, diseases where cancer also is included. This is the other, the third component of the conclusion of the report in terms of health uh, expenditure. Again, substantial differences between the different countries, but overall there has been an increase and in some cases quite substantial related with the GDP of uh, each country. And we know that uh, as a community more and more, it's something that we have to be involved with. Uh, with. This is the annual average growth rate in capita uh, health expenditure. And here we can see that there are some differences among the uh, different countries, but this certainly has an impact in terms of the quality of uh, uh, the deliverable um, uh, health care that is produced, although we know also that there is no linear correlation between the amount of capital that is put into health expenditure and some parameters like life expectancy. Of course, the very uh, uh, first part of the curve is very, is very sharp, but then once you reach a certain level, it doesn't matter how much money you put into the uh, health care system, that the impact that it will have will not be so significant. So we really have to find here also a, a balance so we can make sure that uh, we are cost effective on what we do. So with this background, what is the role that scientific societies such as the ESC or national societies, but here I'll be focusing more on the ESC 
can, uh, can have and how much they can help shaping the future of cardiovascular medicine. Now, using the ESC as an example, is more and more a global society. As you know, it's also a federal society involving many countries, including uh, your own country. This shows the distribution of the different uh, countries that are part of the ESC. In red, what we call the ESC land, and then in green, the, our affiliated the societies. We're working more and more at the uh, global level, which is, uh, is quite interesting also as a, uh, as a doctor and uh, as a community, how much we can exchange with all these different countries. These are some of the primary activities that uh, uh, ESC is developing, which basically tackles some of the most uh, important areas where we've been working. And uh, I will detail some of these areas uh, afterward. But I would say that the role of scientific societies can be divided in these five different areas. Of course, we could consider our, uh, other areas, but I think these five probably summarize some of the areas where, as a scientific society, we can have an impact and we can help to shape and to improve patient care. On one hand, by providing grants, research and training grants, but not only to provide research and uh, particularly the development of registries has been very important so we can have an objective assessment of what is being done in the, uh, in the real life. Uh, different educational activities to define standards and uh, organize guidelines. And then very importantly, more and more, the role in advocacy and lobbying. Just to give you an idea, talking a little bit about research, how much this has been done in Europe. As you know, uh, from 2008 to 13, was the framework uh, program seven. There was the main European program for research grants. And this received about six billion euros, uh, which uh, for this amount of time, it looks quite a lot, but we will see that uh, uh, if we compare, for instance, it with the US, we're still lagging quite behind. The new program, which is the Horizons 2020, there was a substantial increase in the overall budget, 79 billion euros. Health will have about 10 billion euros for this period of 2014 to 20. This just shows the distribution of the FP7 funding for cardiovascular disease research was about 730 million uh, euros. And if we compare, for instance, with uh, what was provided to cancer, cancer got about 2.2 billion euros uh, in uh, uh, EC contribution for research. So despite that we're still the number one uh, killer in, in, uh, in Europe, the amount of money that was provided for research for cardiovascular medicine was quite less when compared, for instance, with what was uh, done for, uh, for cancer. Uh, in the Horizon 2020 program, there are three priorities, excellent science, societal challenges, and also very importantly that we have to improve this in Europe, which is the industrial, the, the link with the industry. As you know, we are still reversed when we compare, for instance, with, uh, with the US, but with the new program, this is, one, this is gonna be one of, uh, uh, one of the priorities. Now, if we compare, for instance, with the budget from the NIH, which is about $30 billion uh, in 2013, I believe in 14 was about the same, with about $3 billion directed toward the NHLBI, which is the correspondent institute that most directly involved with cardiovascular research, we can see that in Europe, despite the increase in the amount of uh, uh, research money, we're still lagging quite behind, and this is certainly one area where our community has to make sure that uh, uh, we have this very clear to the decision makers. Now, another source of uh, financing for research comes from the scientific societies. And uh, some societies, the Netherlands, for instance, the UK, which is probably the leader, the British Heart Foundation, funds about 55% of all cardiovascular research. And it's one of the main contributors for research in Europe, actually, as a, uh, as a whole. So the national societies, and I know that most of the national societies or foundations, they are also providing quite uh, important amounts of uh, research uh, money. At the ESC, we have over the years developed these training and research grants, and uh, this has been uh, changing a little bit over, over time. We decided uh, in this board to increase actually the amount of uh, money for research and training grants. So we believe this is one way where we can help to uh, not only uh, cardiovascular medicine as a whole, but particularly for the young community, this is one way where we can uh, work very closely. This is another project that I also mentioned this morning, and I know that here you've been very active, the cardiologists of uh, tomorrow or the young community projects in the, at the ESC level, where uh, not only at the global level, but also some of the subspecialties, 
They have developed also their own programs addressed to the young communities, and the goal here is to develop, and has been developed over the last uh, five years now, this network of uh, young cardiologists all over Europe or all, all over the ESC land, if we will, and this has proven to be very successful with the uh, tracks at the Congresses, with a lot of networking exchanges, and this has been very, uh, very important and we believe was uh, a very important feature developed at the ESC level with the support, of course, of the different national societies. Now, the second uh, part where the scientific societies can play an important role is on registries and the support of research. The Euro Observational Research Program is one example. We have now running several uh, programs, and here again, with the help of the national societies, is to collect the data that, that can help us to feed into new questions that can help to shape new programs, new trials that can then help to improve guidelines. So basically we have this continuum where uh, the uh, existence and the collection of real data can be very helpful to understand what is the reality and where we can improve. And this has been proven to be very successful and there is already quite a lot of publications and data in that regard. Some programs that can have an immediate translation in terms of clinical practice, one of them is the Stand for Life. And here I just give you a few examples on six countries on how the implementation of Stand for Life actually had an impact in terms of decreasing the percentage of patients with no reperfusion in the setting of, uh, of STEMI. As you know, the Stand for Life was to promote primary angioplasty in STEMI patients. And for instance, one of the extremes is Turkey, where in 2008, about 63% of the patients had no reperfusion. And then in 2011, so four years after the, three years after the, the, the beginning of uh, the program, there was a substantial decrease and a huge decrease in terms of the uh, number of patients with no reperfusion showing the success of this program, which involved a lot of logistical and operational uh, uh, changes, but it shows how a program that is run in a global way can be also uh, useful, important, and have an impact in terms of uh, uh, clinic patient outcome. Educational activities, so here there are many ways where the societies can help to promote good clinical practice through congresses. As you know, at the ESC, we organize now the, the largest cardiovascular event in, uh, um, in, the, in the globe, and this year will be in London, but also through specialty congresses. And uh, we're very happy with the development of all these different uh, areas, also going globally in terms of uh, uh, exchanging with uh, some key countries where we um, try to increase this sort of exchange with China, with Japan, with India, with uh, Brazil, and uh, Argentina, and so on. Through the journals, now we have 14 uh, journals altogether in the ESC journal family with our flagship journal, the European Art Journal with an impact factor close to uh, 15. And we are basically covering here the whole spectrum of uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, including surgery in this uh, uh, family of, uh, of journals and intervention and arrhythmology, uh, imaging, heart failure, nursing, and so on. Uh, there are some scientific tools that also have been, in terms of getting closer to the population, some have been developed by some of our associations, like the Heart Failure Matters, which is a website for the population, and again, it can improve the way we can reach out to our patients, and this is also certainly one way where we can engage the patients into uh, many areas of treatment and so on, and that can help to promote uh, good clinical practice. Through education, our platform has uh, been around for a few years now. It's been very successful, particularly in the subspecialty areas. Now it's also getting more and more use in the uh, global general cardiology area, not only for uh, uh, education, but also for self-assessment, for accreditation. And again, we believe that by using these kind of platforms, we can improve also the way education is, is provided, but also self-assessment and accreditation can be provided at, uh, uh, at the European level. The, by the way, the new website was, uh, uh, was launched, uh, um, it was actually on Friday. I'm using the slide I used in, uh, actually in, in Germany because it was the same day that uh, was launched. And this is uh, uh, the new website gives, uh, uh, I would say, a much better clear path on how to get into the different uh, areas. I will uh, recommend you to look at the, at the new uh, website. It's also adapted for all the different uh, tablets, iPhones, and so on. It's uh, what we say 100% responsible, we, we hope, 
there are still some small uh, fine-tuning that needs to be done, but we hope this can also improve, particularly by using some of the apps that we currently have. It can improve teaching, it can improve patient care. For instance, for some of the areas, you can uh, upload some of uh, uh, the, um, like for guidelines, you can upload some of uh, the guidelines, all the guidelines on your uh, tablets, on your iPhones, and you can do at the, the bedside, in the outpatient clinic, you can basically have access to all this information. So guidelines has been one area where we've also been very proud of the development of uh, uh, the guidelines. They, uh, the goal is they have to be very practical and used by the, medical, uh, uh, by the medical community. We do know that guidelines have a major impact, and I just bring you here a couple of relatively recent studies. This one is, uh, uh, was uh, published in the, um, in the Open Access uh, Journal of uh, AAJ and uh, was about the adherence to guideline recommended uh, therapy in patients with peripheral artery disease, and it uh, basically showed that there was a good correlation if the patients uh, were adhering to the four guideline recommended therapies, there was a much better outcome regardless of uh, the different parameters that were looked at than the patients uh, who, who were not so uh, adherent or not so following uh, the guidelines. So this is hard data demonstrating that uh, uh, the use of uh, and adherence to guidelines has an impact in terms of uh, uh, patient outcome. This is the same thing in this case also published very recently. Uh, the title is uh, Doing the Right Things and Doing Them the Right Way, and again looks at the association between hospital guideline uh, adherence here using the ACC AHA guidelines in acute coronary syndromes, showing the correlation between appropriate uh, antithrombotic dosing and overall guideline uh, adherence, showing a clear uh, trend, and demonstrating that uh, uh, when there was also an impact, when both high adherence and high safety were used, there was an impact in terms of in-hospital major bleeding and in-hospital mortality, again demonstrating the impact of following the guidelines in patient care. Every year we produce four to five new guidelines, and this year again in 2015 there will be uh, five uh, new guidelines, and then many countries translate the guidelines so we can improve the way these guidelines can be disseminated and implemented. Finally, a word on advocacy and lobbying. This is one area where, as a medical community, sometimes we are, particularly in Europe, we have not been so, so good at, but we are working on that over the last few years. We are trying to reach out audiences outside the cardiology community, with the EU, with NGOs, with the healthcare industry, and the fact, and working with the, uh, other societies in the, using global advocacy. This is just one example. A couple of years ago, uh, when we work with the AAJ, with the, Ameri with the uh, ACC, the, the World Health Federation, and the Brazilian Society of Cardiology, which was actually the, uh, the engine that uh, pushed this letter from Rio for prevention, where together we can do some global advocacy. And particularly when we opened our delegation in Brussels uh, two years ago, and uh, these are just a few slides of the opening uh, at that time, we established uh, three areas that we, uh, they are basically an expansion of the activity of the ESC um, in the so-called European Heart Agency to increase the way we can do advocacy and EU affairs. Uh, we created also the European Heart Health Institute. We're developing some tools like uh, uh, an atlas on cardiology that I will show you a little bit, and also the European Heart Academy on developing some programs and some very new programs together with some uh, universities. This is the, uh, the atlas that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very dynamic tool. The goal is to have some sort of a small OECD at, uh, uh, in the Brussels uh, delegation so we can monitor cardiovascular activity in the ESC countries, and uh, we've, we're collecting data also from your country and uh, making uh, sure that uh, we will be able to monitor this data and to have some sort of uh, very objective uh, uh, data and, and uh, dynamic data in the different uh, countries. Uh, as I mentioned, this European Art Academy, we're uh, organizing four different courses. One is running already since last year with Zurich University on heart failure. One is about to start this year. It's a master's on health economics with a cardiovascular disease focus with the London School of Economics and two more which are being organized right now with Maastricht University, an advanced course in arrhythmias and the master's in translational cardiovascular medicine with the University of Hamburg and the German Cardiac Center. Again, uh, starting or pointing now to start uh, next year. Of course, social media can be very important today. But to finalize, I would like to say that the scientific societies, they can play a major role 
as in different areas, but at the end, by having an impact in terms of uh, uh, promoting uh, um, excellent um, clinical practice, because at the end, we want to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease, we want to improve the way we do patient management, we want to promote healthy lifestyles, and through all these different activities, and we could think about others, but through all these different activities, societies such as the ESC, as a continental society, national societies at the smaller scale, they have a major responsibility in the way that they can help the medical community, the scientific community, to improve the way they do patient management. And uh, with this, I will finish with a slide on London, where I, we do hope to have a large community from uh, Israel. So thank you very much.